Hello, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Korea Economic Institute. My name is uh, Sarah Yoon, Director of Public Affairs and Regional Issues at KEI. And um, we do a special welcome for you today because this is not only uh, an exciting event about Korea-Africa uh, economic relations and cooperation, but also uh, this marks the launching of uh, Korea Compass series. This is a brand new series that we are starting at KEI to look at Korea's engagements abroad, especially in developing parts of the world. So what is Korea doing in places like Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, India, and the Middle East? Uh, and what are their interests and how are they partnering with these countries that are different from some of uh, their quote-unquote competitors or you know, quote-unquote um, key players in town such as China and even the United States. So this is a launching event for that. So we're very glad that you're here and we're very happy to launch the event um, looking at Korea-Africa relations specifically. And this series was inspired um, by, especially inspired by President Lee's recent trip as well. And he mentioned a lot about um, Korea's need to participate in international development, Korea's need to give back to the rest of the world, and Korea's rise as a, a, a unique leader in the world. So we hope that this series is a good look into that uh, and, and an anal analytical look into that as well. So today we are um, launching the series with the, uh, a, an event on Korea-Africa relations, as I mentioned, and the title of the event is The Korean Approach in Africa, Sustainable Development Through Public-Private Partnership. And we are joined by three expert speakers. And um, th our first speaker will be Philippe de Ponte. Uh, Philippe de Ponte is the head of Eurasia Group's Africa practice. Eurasia Group is a preeminent research and advisory firm for investors evaluating risks and opportunities in emerging markets worldwide. Philippe's focus is on the frontier markets of East and Southern Africa. He leads the firm's risk analysis in key mineral-rich nations, including the Democratic Republic of Congo and Zambia, and on the emerging energy producers outside of West Africa, including Sudan. He also has a background in development, foreign assistance, and donor relations in Africa. Our spe second speaker will be Young Tae Kim, Young Tae Kim is a counselor for construction, transport, and maritime affairs at the Embassy of the Republic of Korea. Since August 2011, he has been working in Washington, D.C., representing the Ministry of Land, Transport, and Maritime Affairs of the Korean government. Right before he came to the U.S., he worked as the director for overseas construction division of this ministry, where he made numerous business trips all over the world, including various parts of Africa and in conjunction and in cooperation with private and public infrastructure related organizations. Our third and last speaker, but certainly not the least, is Raymond Gilpin. Raymond Gilpin is the Associate Vice President of the Sustainable Econo uh, Economy Centers of Innovation at the United States Institute of Peace. He leads uh, USIP's work on analyzing relationships among economic actors during all stages of conflict. He teaches the Economics and Conflict course at the USIP Academy and manages the web-based international network for economics and conflict. So to say the least, we are in the room with um, three great experts on Korea-Africa relations. So without further ado, I'm going to invite our first speaker, Philippe, to come up to the podium. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, so I'm going to lay out a couple of a couple of ideas here in about 15 minutes. Um, I think the idea is to set up essentially the the other two speakers who will speak more specifically about sort of the Korea Korean engagement in Africa, uh, commercial engagement, and also uh, sort of a, a model of engagement through uh, PPPs, public-private partnerships. Um, you know, as a way to to mitigate risk and also uh, get local buy-in and sustainability on, on big investments. So just to, starting with the, the, the big picture for a second, Africa, as most of you probably know, is, is it's not the same continent uh, we might remember from the 1990s when quite a few countries were, were racked in war. 
there had been a couple of decades really of economic stagnation and seemingly no, no obvious way uh, out. Um, South Africa, the, the real engine in many ways of the, of the continent was only then emerging from apartheid. And in, in a lot of the important uh, countries like Nigeria, you had um, kleptocratic and uh, military rule in many cases. If you fast forward to, to the present day, it, it is a, a substantially different picture. Uh, by and large, I think the, 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 the trends are positive. They're, w whenever you're talking about 55 different countries, there are, there are plenty of exceptions. Uh, there, there, there are Somalias in, or Sudans for, uh, for every Botswana and Ghana, for example. But overall, the, the trends, I think, are pretty, pretty clearly in the positive direction overall. Uh, civil war has subsided in many of those countries. You know, Angola, as one example, uh, had been racked for decades in, in sort of a Cold War uh, era struggle. Well, now, now the country's been booming for a decade and is, is, uh, is giving Nigeria a real run for its money in terms of uh, energy production uh, export, uh, nearing two million barrels per day, which is you know, significant even on the global scale. Uh, it, beyond Libya, for example. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing that's improved. There, there has been better, better governance, by and large, um, in, in many of these countries. Um, so governments that are, that are more serious about uh, economic development that have a better, uh, though still flawed, track record on transparency or on you know, real sort of dem democratic uh, openness. Um, and on the economic side, for sure, uh, you know, it's been about a decade, maybe decade plus now, of, 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 of broad economic growth, five, six percent average. There's a lot of variation around the mean, but, um, and surely, to be sure, from a very low base, but, you know, five, six percent growth for a decade plus is, uh, is not, is significant and it's not, it's not entirely or even necessarily mostly because of, of the, you know, commodity price spikes that we've seen in the last four or five years in particular. That's a piece of the, piece of the story, but, but only one of many. Okay, real quickly, sort of just thinking about the, the, the investment or trade landscape in Africa, uh, I would just sort of simplify or oversimplify it by saying, you know, you, you have your sort of booming resource-rich countries, uh, the Nigerias, Angolas, Ghanas, et cetera, uh, oil mining and, and other resources. Uh, you have you have economies that are relatively you know more developed and relatively diversified, and so and so less de you know less dependent on one or two exports. Uh, you know here you have South Africa, Kenya, possibly Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Senegal, and so, some North North African countries as well. Um, and then thirdly, you have, and th there's some overlap, but there's also sort of countries that, that, are, that are relatively large markets, uh, you know, for, for exporters, uh, partly because of population, population growth, urbanization, together with the, the fast uh, growth trajectory, um, and some other factors. So, you know, South Africa, <laughs> Nigeria, even, even a country that's extremely poor like Ethiopia um, is, is actually a, potentially a significant export market for certain goods. Uh, population is, is nearing 100 million. Uh, Nigeria is well beyond that. Okay, so the second part of what I wanted to just lay out briefly was, was sort of the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, engagement in Africa, since, particularly since 2000. Um, for sure, you know, there's been Chinese diplomatic and commercial interest uh, for centuries in Africa, but I think around Around, around the late 90s, around 2000, we, we saw just a dramatic upturn, both, both on trade and investment. Now, I think part, partly this was driven by, uh, you know, by, the, by China's sort of insatiable interest for, in resources. Uh, and by that measure, the engagement's been pretty successful. When you think about energy security, um, about a third of China's energy imports now come from, from Africa, uh, you know, which is potentially a hedge against other kinds of instability. So that's, you know, if you, from a national perspective, that's arguably a pretty good return on investment, um, even though that's only, again, part of the, part of the puzzle. Sorry, Sarah, do I have, can you pass me the water? I just don't want to get parched. <laughs> 
Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so and so sure enough, we've seen um, you know explosion of, of, of trade flows from uh, just over 10 billion in the late 90s to over 100 billion, uh, and it's 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 becoming I think increasingly di diversified. It's not just African resources and and Chinese um, you know Chinese manufactured goods, although that is that is for sure a, a a, a major dynamic and one that, that could be problematic um, over time. Um, so, it, and, the, and the big trade partners, just in short, are, are basically uh, Angola and Sudan, uh, because that's, that's where the, the energy relationship is tightest. In both cases, China was able to move, move in almost as a f first mover, well, not, not as a first mover, certainly not in Angola. But in Sudan, as a first mover of sorts, because uh, Sudan was under sanctions and pariah state, et cetera, so there was, there was much less competition. And, and that's where they went in big, uh, I think, first. And um, you know, again, fast forward a decade or so, and, and, and Sudan uh, provides about 6% of their, of their energy imports. And, and is, you know, signif that's significant, uh, for sure. And Angola is actually even more than that now. Um, uh, for a while, Angola was its top, China's top energy uh, source. Uh, and I think since a couple of years back, since then, um, I think both Saudi Arabia and Iran have moved, moved ahead. But, but clearly, Angola and Sudan are, are important. And then uh, lastly, I would say South Africa uh, as well uh, in, a, in a more diverse way. Um, and on the investment front, you know, there, the, uh, it's also, you know, booming activity. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the big ticket item type investment is is sort of infrastructure resource related, often with sort of explicit or implicit links between the resource piece and the infrastructure piece, as as um, you know, plenty of companies do in Africa and elsewhere, including uh, Korean ones. Um, but that's certainly been a when you look at sort of the. Chinese peristatals, at least, um, you know that's that's been a huge huge component of the of the um, engagement. And in addition to Sudan and Angola, sort of there's a second wave, I would say, of significant investment, uh, potentially ga potentially game changing investment in some countries, uh, in in places like DRC, uh, Congo, Zambia, uh, more recently Ghana, uh, and um, possibly in the future Nigeria. Uh, Chinese, Chinese companies have had a hard time actually cracking Nigeria, um, uh, but, uh, but they're still trying. Um, OK, so last, last thing I wanted to just lay out was a couple thoughts on, on sort of this, the, uh, the approach that under, underlies this engagement. But first, let me just say, you know, there's more than 800 Chinese companies operating in, in Africa. They're everywhere. The vast majority of them are small, medium-sized, uh, or even mom-and-pop uh, kind of businesses that don't, don't rely on and don't get uh, you know, support one way or another from Beijing. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now, those are mostly, you know, like I say, small and medium-sized, but that, that is a huge component that, that shouldn't be forgotten here. I'm, I'm focusing more on, the, again, the, the, the national oil companies, the peristatals, the the billion dollar plus uh, investments. Um, so in short, you know, the model, as, as I suggested, uh, at least at the outset, and for sure in resource rich but infrastructure poor countries, of which there are many, is, is sort of this, this infrastructure for resources uh, model as, a, as a, a way of market entry, you know, typically supported by, by relatively cheap loans you know, by the Chinese uh, Export Import Bank and the Development Bank as well, uh, with most of the most of the work uh, essentially being done by Chinese companies too. Um, and so, what the what the African governments get in the bargain uh, essentially is, uh, in theory, is, is infrastructure, which is hugely important, very well uh, very well received, politically helpful to to leaders at, at local and national levels. Uh, crucial for econ for actual economic development. So you know, w w there 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 is a scope for win-win um, 
arguably, you know, when, when, uh, when this is done right. Um, the Chinese have, have um, you know, been good, I think, about sort of tapping into the government priorities, um, whether it's sort of developmental priorities uh, that are that are seen as, as by the, the by the government as uh, as particularly crucial, or you know sometimes uh, they're good at tapping into to sort of pet projects, prestige projects, uh, you know il sort of elite uh, <laughs> things that 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 perhaps elites want, uh, but don't necessarily bring that much to the broader uh, to the broader country, and that can be problematic. So. You know, in some countries, uh, they're 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 doing very large investments in in remote villages that happen to be you know hometown of the president and and um, people around him. There's quite a bit of that too, and that speaks to obviously can speak to to sort of the um, the, the corruption aspect that that can get tied up in in this. Um, likewise, in, in in a lot of cases, though not always. Uh, um, you know these big Chinese plays uh, are supported by upfront bonus payments that are, in an African context, real sweeteners. Um, you know, so 350 million dollars uh, to the government of, of Joseph Kabila in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was, you know, essentially the the uh, the bonus payment for the big six billion dollar infrastructure resource deal they hammered out. That's a huge that's a huge deal that plugs. All kinds of uh, budget deficits, and also, particularly in, in countries that are poorly governed, uh, can 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 mean a lot of money that goes missing. So, lastly, um, lastly, I, I guess I've I've suggested some of the limits of this model, which I'm oversimplifying a little bit. One one, of course, is uh, to the extent that a lot of the work is done by Chinese companies, Chinese workers. No surprise that that's, that's not well received in countries that have very high unemployment, um, you know, and where the people, frankly, are perfectly capable of, of, of doing a lot of the work and certainly the, the, the sort of the, uh, the uh, menial uh, labor, uh, but, but also some, some of the other stuff, too. So that's, that builds resentment. Um, another issue is that, you know, these infrastructure loans don't come free, uh, and so in a lot of cases they get you know, they get paid off essentially via exports or through other mechanisms that, you know, from the government's perspective means that, you know, in the early years of a very significant investment, it, it, it seems like there's not significant revenues really coming in because you're, you're busily paying off the, the infrastructure loans. And that can create some alienation over time. Also, alienation of local business communities uh, can be a real issue as, as elsewhere in the, in the world where, um, where there's a perception that the Chinese goods are flooding the markets, that there's predatory, uh, predatory practices in terms of pricing. Uh, this is often by the, the smaller Chinese non-government affiliated players, but it, it can build, it can be very hard to compete and that can, that can sort of make broader uh, Chinese engagement uh, controversial and tricky um, and then lastly would be would be sort of a, a a very strong focus on elite level connections in the capital you know with the, with with the head of state and his closest associates but often or at least in the past this might be changing a bit of a, a blind a blind spot about issues in in local communities where they might work grassroots sentiment Opposition, uh, opposition uh, critiques that 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 you know might be legitimate, and in worst in a worst case scenario, uh, as as we saw a couple of years ago in Ethiopia, you know you had um, Sinopec essentially targeted by by a, a rebel group in the eastern part of Ethiopia that uh, ended up killing uh, I think nine Chinese workers and many more Ethiopians. Uh, but I, I think they, they saw Sinopec as a proxy, basically, for, uh, for the, the Mellis government in Addis Ababa, and, and therefore they were seen as legitimate as a target. So that's you know, sort of a worst case scenario. All right, let me, let me hand off uh, at this point to Raymond uh, and just say that the connection in a sense, or what, what I'd like the connection to be, is that I've, I've raised some, some concerns about 
uh, you know, drawbacks to this model, potential for backlash and, and lack of, you know, real buy-in uh, at a local level. And I think Raymond is going to talk us through the PPP model as a, as a way uh, to, to alleviate some of those pressures um, that we hope would be relevant also for Korean companies. Thanks. Nice to see you, uh, and I very, I, I'm very happy to see many friendly faces among the audience, and it was a big surprise for me, because I found an uh, old-time friend too, an old-time colleague, and some of my friends in DC too. Uh, personally, uh, when, I, when I was preparing uh, for this uh, presentation, I found it very difficult to um, Make a very uh, accurate point, or some, some, some get some core issues uh, of this subject, because the more I know about Africa, the more difficult the discussions becomes. And uh, now it's the African con continent is composed of 54 countries, except one uh, Western Sahara, which is now recognized by uh, a country by UN. So it's uh, 54, but recently the Sudan was divided into two countries, so it became 54 officially. And uh, this is my personal photo uh, taken in uh, <laughs> Democratic Republic of Congo. I've been to Africa for uh, five, five times, and uh, I enumerated the countries I visited. And from Madagascar, Angola, DR Congo, Ghana, Cameroon, Tanzania, South Africa, Republic, and Equatorial Guinea and Algeria and Mauritius. And actually at the time I was uh, guarded by uh, police all the time. So uh, today I'm gonna speak about uh, my experiences and my understandings and my findings based on uh, some facts and some uh, analysis. Uh, so my content the first I will talk about Korea's interest in Africa, why Korea is now interested in Africa. And in the second part, why are African countries interested in Korea? And why any unique approaches of Korea that can be distinguished from Chinese ways of uh, former Western ways. And in the fourth chapter, I will talk about Korea's roles for Africa's sustainable development. And finally, uh, what are challenges and risks in Africa? So, I'll be uh, very quickly. Uh, before uh, beginning, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Korea. Maybe you know already very well about my country. And our country is very small, located in the far east of Asia, and uh, blocked by uh, North Korea and communist bloc. So, um, we could not survive on our own. So uh, I, I, will, I will say later, but uh, after the Korean War, the G GNP per capita was only 67 US dollars. But uh, finally, in 2007, uh, it became almost $20,000 per person. So uh, we made a very rapid economic growth, actually, uh, with the help of international communities, of course, and in exchange goods and services with outside world. Especially, we were focusing on uh, processing trade. We imported natural resources, and we made goods, and we exported them. That was the first strategy uh, at the beginning of the Korea's economic development. For your information, I uh, compared <laughs> Korea and USA, but it's not so natural to make this kind of comparison, because two countries are totally different in terms of size and the history and culture and everything. But um, to show you, uh, Korea is really a small country. And some but a lot of uh, people living on this uh, small country. 
But uh, we have some uh, leading items uh, these days, for example, uh, in information technology and uh, shipbuilding uh, industry and some infrastructures. And especially uh, last year, the total contract amount of uh, Korean overseas constru construction business uh, reached $70 billion. But 70% uh, was focused on uh, Middle East region. So we have to uh, diversify our uh, markets and diversify our uh, partners. But uh, uh, usually, uh, when we talk about this kind of subject, we, uh, we have a tendency to uh, focus on economic aspect. But before that, I would like to stress one important thing. Uh, if we consult the preamble of the Korean constitution, for example, uh, we can find this uh, phrase, the Koreans peop Korean people have determined to contribute to lasting world peace and common prosperity of mankind. It goes beyond the uh, economic aspect because we also suffered in the past and we experienced also uh, colonization and we experienced extreme poverty too. So uh, uh, our idea and our vision uh, relates to uh, the peace of uh, the world, world, world uh, prosperity and mankind, etc. So I, I, I would uh, simplify it. I, I simplified the historical evolution of Korea uh, as follows. The phase one is uh, misery, and the second phase is breakthrough, uh, rapid economic growth, and democratization, of course, with uh, help from international community. And phase three is payback. It means uh, contribution to the world. So uh, I would like to tell you uh, two aspects uh, of the Korea's interest in Africa. One is economic aspect, the other is political aspect. But economic, in, in the economic aspect, uh, also they can be uh, divided into two. Uh, for example, the first one is uh, the capability aspect, and the second one is real need aspect. And now, uh, Korea can uh, do many things in the world with the uh, economic powers and <coughs> technologies and experiences. Also a lot of uh, savoir faire, knowledges, etc. But in real need aspect, uh, we are in lack of uh, natural resources still. Uh, actually, uh, the Korea is a small country, but or the, the rate of urbanization is uh, less than 5%. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, uh, urbanized territory among the whole territory is less than 5%. Uh, the rate of urbanization is more than 90%, of course. But uh, we don't uh, have any petroleum, and we don't, we don't have any uh, important minerals, so we usually export them from uh, our friendly nations, friendly neighbors. And from the polit political aspect, uh, we'd, we would like to do more roles in the in international uh, sense. Um, as you know well, Mr. Ban Ki-moon is the Secretary General of the United Nations. And like that, uh, we would like to send many uh, people to the international uh, sense. So we would like to uh, win a lot of support from uh, different nations, uh, including uh, African countries. In terms of the number of African countries, 28% of member countries of the UN, that means uh, that occupies 28% of uh, voices from uh, UN decision making process. In Africa, uh, as you see on the table, uh, from uh, early 1990s, the rate of uh, economic growth is higher than, uh, than the world average. So uh, that's the continent where we, we find the fastest rate of economic development in the world. That means that there is uh, so much potentiality. And for your reference, I, I show you some uh, evolution of the Korean companies' activities in world construction markets. And as you see, uh, the recently, since especially since 2006, uh, the volume uh, became uh, more important these days. And last year, 
it reached more than uh, 70 billion, and this year too, we have uh, a big hope. But uh, if you see uh, the second <coughs> graph, this is mostly uh, in the uh, Middle East, and this is Africa. Africa is occupies a small portion, still very small portion. And of course, North, Northern uh, America and Europe and Latin America also is very uh, weak activities of the Korean companies. There are several regions, but uh, uh, I don't, uh, I will not uh, speak very uh, in detail. So uh, I, I will I show you some images of the landmarks constructed uh, uh, in the foreign countries by, by Korean companies. For example, in Dubai, uh, you see uh, Burj Khalifa, 828 meters high, and Penang Bridge, the longest bridge in Asia, in Malaysia, and uh, Lahore Islamabad Expressway in Pakistan, and Great Mamed River in Libya, and Fuzaira Desalination Plant in Arab Emirates. So the kind of uh, infrastructures were all constructed by uh, Korean companies. S still a lot more. But uh, as I told you, uh, <coughs> we are in lack of natural resources. 84.1% of the total energy consumed in 2010 in Korea related to the imported fossil fuels. And in 2010, Korea consumed 794.5 million barrels of petroleum. 81.8% of the imported petroleum came from the Middle East countries. And Korea is also a big importer of uh, minerals. And uh, in from the political aspect, we see a lot of uh, regional communities uh, blooming in Africa. For example, UMA, in Maghreb, Union of Maghreb Africa, and ECOVAS, and SACU, COMESA, etc. Et but also, uh, Finally, Africa tends to make one voice through the African Union. Then why are African countries interested in Korea? Because they are facing a new situation and they are in a new need. For example, political stability. Recently, a lot of civil wars are ending and they, uh, they are starting a new democracy. Of course, they, their democracy is not perfect, and their democracy is very uh, rudimentary. But uh, they are starting a new democracy, it's sure, because a lot of leaders, new leaders, are trying to uh, make some consensus building among people, and they try to uh, present some visions and goals in the long term. And performances of existing cooperation channels, and too much dependence on Western powers. Uh, from my personal experiences, I found still a lot of Western influences in African countries. That's, that's, that's natural because they constructed a lot of uh, infrastructures in the colonial period, and also they uh, left their language and also their culture and some food and etc. Everything, but uh, African African people didn't seem to uh, fully uh, didn't seem to be fully uh, satisfied with this uh, this reality uh, i talked I, I met a lot of high officials <coughs> they they uh, mostly they studied in uh, western world in uh, britain and france and united states etc but they have for their uh, visions and goals they got influence from uh, western societies but uh, they want a new change. They want to make their country uh, something different from what it is today. So um, they are trying to find new partners and trying to find new items and new uh, friends. And they also have some dealing power because uh, the civil war ended. Civil war are ending. So the leaders, they have some control over their territory and some hidden uh, natural resources, strong. So the first tactic is diversification of cooperation partners from Western powers, China, and <coughs> to uh, some other nations. And tactic two is realization of rapid economic development. The leaders, they want to show something very quickly. So they, uh, they need some uh, references, and they need some 
something to benchmark. But in this context, maybe Korea can be a very good reference and very good example for them. Because uh, as I told you earlier, in 1953, our GNP per capita was 67, only 67 US dollars. And in, even in 1962, early 1960s, the GNP per capita in Korea was 110, is far less than uh, Ghana and Philippines and Ivory Coast. Even in the 1960s, we could not construct a gymnasium so a Philippine construction company, they came to Korea and they built the first gymnasium <coughs> of Korea. And this is the image of Yeoido, where uh, Congress is located. Uh, a photo was taken in 1971, but these days it became like this. So in 2011, so it was uh, filled with a lot of skyscrapers and high rises. Night view of Gangnam areas in 2011. Too much alcohol and <laughs> too much entertainment. <laughs> there can be some social problem, but <laughs> sometimes I go there too <laughs> with my colleagues and friends. Night view of Seoul, 2011. So it's a great change. And infrastructures, domestic infrastructures. And I, I, sh I show you some new towns and new ports and expressway, and Incheon Bridge, Causeway on the Western Sea, and high-speed rail too. Any unique approaches of Korea? That's a very uh, difficult subject. In fact, as uh, Philip uh, told you in the previous session, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese influences are very strong in uh, African nations. And in terms of volume and in terms of uh, financial aids, financial subsidy, the Korea cannot be a rival. So, um, and especially, uh, I, I made a comparison uh, with the Chinese and Korean approaches slightly. I talk about it later. So approaches of Korea uh, is uh, the first strategy, sharing knowledge and experience, because the Korean case is a very unique case in this world. We made such a quick economic experience. And we got help from outside world, but now we are giving help to the outside world. It's a very uh, unique uh, example in the 20, 20th century. And provide a way to catch fish rather than just give fish. And Korea really understand what poverty is. That's what I tell my friends very often. That means <coughs> our father's generation and our grandfather's generation, they experienced ex uh, extreme poverty, but they are still alive. But in uh, Western societies, their economic development was made over a hundred years and over a long time. So the first generation that experienced <coughs> extreme poverty, they uh, passed away already. So now um, we, we know the poverty <coughs> theoretically and the really in our life. We feel it, we can feel it. So the government is now running an official program called KSP, Knowledge Sharing Program, to help the countries in need, uh, especially in Africa, DR Congo and Ghana, Libya and Algeria benefited from this uh, program. And there are still more and more countries that benefit from this uh, program. And public-private partnership, uh, ODA plus business, that means that the Korea uh, during the, the period of economic development, the Korean government played a very important role. And some public bodies under the control of the Korean government also played a very important role. So we set up uh, various kinds of uh, public bodies like K-Waters for uh, hydraulic resources and Korea Expressway Corporation, Housing Corporation and Airport Corporation, etc. and many more. So we have a kind of uh, role distribution between public sector and private <coughs> sector. And maybe that's what African countries need these days. And Korea, uh, the history of Korea for the, the engagement uh, in the development of Africa, it was only in 2006, so it's relatively recent compared to uh, Chinese, Chinese approach. So uh, in terms of volume and in terms of uh, frequencies and in terms of uh, intensity, uh, we are weaker, weaker than uh, China. That's true, but uh, 
as I told you, we have some different kinds of uh, approaches. And in 2009, uh, Seoul Declaration, according to the Seoul Declaration, uh, the Korea-Africa Development Cooperation Plan was set up, an increase of ODA for Africa up to uh, 200 million by 2012, and such kind of uh, financial measures were taken. And China, from 2000, the first China-Africa Cooperation Forum, every three years, they make some gift for African countries. For the first China-Africa Cooperation Forum, they exempted debt of 100 million US dollars and plan for educating 1,000 Africans, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, sometimes it's called aid for oil strategy because the Chinese people are seeking to, uh, to find some oils in, in these African countries. Sometimes it's criticized by uh, local people. But as I, as I uh, met people uh, in Africa, the officials once told me that uh, the Chinese, uh, Chinese presence, the problems linked to Chinese presence, uh, there can be uh, a lot of problems, but uh, they uh, told me one or two things. That's also a kind of uh, problems they uh, raised. They, they told me, and the other one is uh, when they uh, are constructing a lot of infrastructures in African countries, also there are a lot of Chinese workers arriving from uh, China, Chinese mainland, and they, uh, they do not speak the, the local language, and they form a certain uh, limited, limited uh, community. Uh, they have some uh, problems of uh, mingling with the local people. So, uh, by and by, uh, a lot of local people find one small shops and two shops and three shops on the street <coughs> occupying the whole existing areas. So they can be uh, a social exclusion, geographical and ethnical the problems. So that kind of uh, integration problem uh, remains in, in China. So now uh, the roles of Korea uh, 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 the first role is maybe helping to set up long-term strategic plan. Unless they have uh, long-term strategic plans, they have no uh, direction, no orientation. So uh, we, uh, we uh, introduced a five-year economic development plan in 1962 and 10-year plan in, uh, in 1972 for territorial development. So we uh, update every five years and every 10 years. And social systemization or institutionalization, that means helping to make rules, laws, and institutions. With these rules and laws and institutions, the society can become more transparent and clear. Without them, the disposition can make a different uh, results and different reactions of the administration and sharing, also sharing information technologies. And exchange of human resources. The human resources are very important because the system is operated by human beings. So we are trying to provide training programs in various sectors. And we also try to participate in uh, MDV project. That means uh, in Washington there are so many uh, organiz world organizations like uh, IBRD and I IMF. And Etc. So uh, they are not commercial bank. They are helping countries in need. So we try to be uh, with them for the same goal. And finding credible financial resources. Also, every project should be uh, backed by uh, financial measures. And mingling with local communities is also very important. Donation in various forms, such as construction of landmark and social work for the people in need. But uh, we can present a lot of uh, this kind of positive uh, approaches, but in reality, we have uh, a lot of challenges and risks in Africa. So uh, I feel that it's going to take some time for African countries to get well equipped with uh, different infrastructures and social institutions, etc. So I say uh, Africa is waking up, but.
uh, there are some risk factors like non-transparency still exist. So a lot of uh, U United Nations and some uh, IBRD, uh, they are concerned about anti-corruption measures. So they have special, special division called uh, public sector reform or something like that. And lack of high-skilled workers and also great diversity in artificially fixed territory and difficult trade-off of national natural resources and infrastructure. This is a risk factor uh, analyzed by Global Insight in, uh, in America, but uh, the, the, the countries of high risk uh, contain a lot of Latin American countries rather than African countries. And low risk countries, uh, the top number one is USA and South Korea is number 12. And this one is for your reference. Uh, in 1888, the Berlin uh, conf Conference, organized by uh, Bismarck in, in Germany, they uh, drew the uh, bo artificial borders that uh, that make people cohabit in a limited areas. So, uh, my my understanding was that uh, every time I went to uh, the Africa, I could find a lot of diversities and a lot of different factors in a within a <coughs> boundary. So uh, maybe there can be a structural problem for the development. So uh, we have to fully understand the diversity of the tribes and uh, small communities scattered all around the world. So uh, we cannot only discuss with the uh, the federal government or the central government, etc. So, um, very briefly, uh, within two, 20 minutes, I <laughs> I talked about the situations and my uh, personal experiences. So, uh, it, it's not enough. Uh, it, it's true, but if you maybe if you are interested in uh, knowing more about this uh, subject, you can email me or you can contact me. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be talking a bit about um, public-private pri partnerships as a potential model for uh, Korean engagement across the African continent. Um, so I, I'd like to thank the organizers for this, uh, putting this together. It's really refreshing when people take, take a minute to have a fresh look at the African continent and um, look at possibilities and analyze models that would have a greater and probably even more lasting impact. I'll speak very briefly about Korea in Africa and then conclude by saying um, you know, that I think that um, we need a fresh look at opportunities and challenges across the continent. I'll talk uh, briefly about um, public-private partnerships in Africa, and then explore some what I believe are opportunities for mutually beneficial PPP in and across the African continent. Um, apologies for the small funds, but um, in 2009, this is what um, Korea African trade looked like in terms of geography. In terms of Korean exports to Africa, over one third went to one country, Liberia. And this was basically f uh, related to um, Liberian um, registered vessels. So it had very little to do with the Liberian e or, or African economy. And uh, the rest of the countries you would see, and as um, the uh, previous speaker pointed out, it's mainly focused on energy and mineral resources. Um, ditto imports from Africa. The only country that actually um, has about half of its exports to Korea being non-minerals is South Africa, where you have some um, re-imports and manufactured goods uh, making their way to um, Korea. 
If you look at foreign direct investment um, from um, <coughs> Korea to Africa, in 2001, it was 16.9 million dollars total. But this grew significantly to $374 million total by 2009. Significant jump. But if you compare this with the um, $100 billion that China is doing, it pales in comparison. Um, this is what it looked like as a proportion of Korean FDI over the years. And you can see that um, currently it is just about 1.5 total Korean um, FDI to the 54 African countries is less than 1.5% of total Korean FDI worldwide. Um, and what are the sectors? No, no, no big surprise here. Um, over three quarters is in the mining sector. Um, by way of comparison, at the beginning of the 2000, of 2000, in, uh, in 2000 it was a, about half of the FDI going to the mineral sector. This has grown to three quarters. And you could see that construction and infrastructure <coughs> account for only um, 3%. I highlight these because I'll be coming back um, to um, construction and uh, infrastructure when I talk about um, PPPs. Aid, on the other hand, has grown, um, foreign assistance, in, um, in, in a 2004, African countries accounted for just about 1% of total Korean aid. By 2008, it had grown to 16%, or roughly 95, 96 million US dollar equivalent. Um, this is important um, for reasons that I would return to in my conclusion. But let's look at the composition of, um, composition of the assistance, uh, the green um, represents um, economic services, the magenta, um, social services, yellow, emergency assistance, and red, others. You see that mainly this reflects that the Korean assistance prism for Africa is mainly developmental and humanitarian. And as I would argue going forward, that we have a lot of opportunities across the continent to target this aid more judiciously so it helps spur private sector growth in country that is mutually beneficial to what I would argue is one of um, Korea's economic comparative advantages worldwide. So why do we need a fresh look at, African, at, at Africa? Firstly, re recent economic growth speaks for itself. It's not just a few countries, it's across the continent. It's not just in oil economies, it's in oil and non-oil economies. And largely, most people agree, or are slowly agreeing, that um, most of the, that the um, significant GDP growth we've seen over the last decade is a result of significant macroeconomic and policy reforms made by these countries. And uh, which means that the framework and the institutional parameters are becoming slightly more predictable. Um, secondly, Africa has a significant infrastructure gap. Whether you're thinking about power, I'm sure you've all seen the, um, map, the map of the world at night with the lights, and Africa is the quote-unquote dark continent. That speaks to a huge power gap, water um, and transportation. Those are major gaps that are keeping these economies that seem to be emerging from moving on to the next level. And the th one of the reasons why we don't see a lot more foreign direct investment in Africa, not just from Korea, but from elsewhere in the world, is that because people are concerned about the predictability of regulatory frameworks, concerned about corruption, concerned about absorptive capacity, concerned basically about risk. But I would argue that public-private partnerships help not just mitigate risks by pooling the risks, but also helps guarantee public sector um, support. And this takes the form not just of um, concessions and market access, but also takes the form of governments being stakeholders in the process and prioritizing improvements in regulatory and judicial um, arrangements locally. So 
I think that there are many types of public pri public private partnerships. You have um, the build own operate, build own transfer, build transfer operate, etc. Um, but I think I generally having private companies partner locally um, helps um, facilitates increased um, foreign direct investment flows. It also improves the um, business climate by strengthening institutions. It, um, imp it, it um, enhances the transfer of techniques and technology from the partnering countries to the um, host countries. And it also helps improve service delivery because a lot of the gaps we talked about, I, I mentioned earlier, water, electricity, transportation, most of these are deemed public goods um, broadly, and uh, there's usually some initial resistance by communities to have these things, quote unquote, privatized. So, um, uh, public private partnerships are not new on the continent, they're actually growing. And um, uh, thank you very much to the Korean Economic Institute for launching this new series. And I would commend this document to you. Um, uh, all disclaimers. <laughs> and um, we talk, and this, this and document um, talks a little bit more about these three examples of PPP in Africa. But let me just say briefly why I highlighted these. Um, the, tr the toll road, the N4, between South Africa, uh, the Republic of South Africa and Mozambique is an example of a regional approach to um, public-private partnerships. So where companies are unsure about either the size of the market or regulatory arrangements, a regional approach to PPP could help out. And having more than one country involved, it expands the market. But significantly, as was the case with this toll road, it allows for cross-subsidization in the cost structure. So countries that are less able are still able to benefit from the public service um, being provided through PPP. Or you could pool the um, functions together, as um, the French company um, Vivendi did in Gabon, where you have a multi-utility model, where it's not just um, water, but it is water provision and um, water provision, sewage, and some electricity. Um, this is also an example of um, pooling risk. And uh, the third example is, an ex is, an exa is, is, is uh, the first two are the good news stories. Uh, there, is there is potential. But the third is an example of where you did not have the requisite institutional and regulatory commitment from the government, and things did not go very well. So um, as both um, previous speakers uh, pointed out, um, Yes, there are opportunities, but we must not um, forget that um, challenges do exist. Addressing those challenges, I think there are four main things that should be done. First, PPP only works in Africa or anywhere else in the world if it's part of the national development strategy. Korea is an, ex an example of where uh, public-private partnerships were rolled into national development um, plans. So the, we, we see a lot of the both greenfield and uh, maintenance um, projects of over the last decade in Korea benefiting from the um, wealth of um, PPP, um, wealth of PPP-friendly regulations and laws in Korea. And so in Africa as well, we need to ha make sure that the PPP fits within the national development strategy. Secondly, the government must be committed to upgrading skills and technology. Third, they should prioritize both legislative and, judiciary, um, and judicial arrangements. And fourth, since a lot of these infrastructure gaps are in that gray public, semi-public good um, zo um, zone, um, this, the um, citizen should be sensitized. Um, the previous speaker mentioned some of the um, responses, local responses to um, Chinese engagements, uh, which makes for um, really difficult community corporate um, relations. Um, but to make PPP work, you need a lot of sensitization and involvement from the communities. Okay, so Korea, Africa, moving ahead. This is mainly for um, on, on the Korea side. 
First, I think that Korea and companies should take a second look at Africa. Because even though they have uh, $70 billion worth of infrastructure projects um, uh, externally, internally, public-private partnerships in 2009 accounted for about $45 billion worth of um, infrastructure projects in Korea. I think that the 54 countries on the, Africa, on the African continent present a wide market, especially where you pool resources and do and have a regional approach. Secondly, um, and the previous speaker mentioned the Korea Africa Forum, I really think that we should move beyond the Korea Africa Forum. It reads very much like the Chinese docu um, doc document. And uh, there is a line, um, a reference line made to infrastructure, another reference line made to PPP. I think that Korea's, Korea's history with PPP over the last 15 years has a lot that could benefit the African continent, both in terms of the legislative um, amendments, particularly the 2005 amendment to the PPP Act in Korea. Um, also in terms of the way the major institutions were rejigged to encourage and reward companies participating in, in PPP. And these things could benefit um, companies that are more outward looking. And uh, I don't think the Korean Korea Africa Forum is a great thing, but I think it's great politically in terms of moving the private sector, I think that we need a bit more to be done to energize um, Korean companies who have done, we saw the photographs, wonderful things across the world. And Africa has this huge gap and is the world's fastest growing market in terms of um, openly bid infrastructure projects. And, uh, and, and, and that should be um, taken care of. Third, I think Korea should strategically redirect its aid. Okay, yes, yes, we do have a lot of humanitarian crises on the African continent, but we do have a number of emerging markets that need that small push to be able to move on to that next level that speaks to homegrown ownership and long-term sustainability. And within the context of PPP, this speaks to increasing managerial and um, project um, capacities, um, investing in technology transfers, et cetera, so that the government will be able to manage PP PPP and be more active um, participants. Fourth, I think that the, um, comp um, the competitive advantage of Korean companies should, could be le leveraged. And fourth, I think that uh, there should be more facilities and instruments um, to help um, uh, motivate um, Korean companies to become more engaged. Um, particularly, I think the um, Public-Private Infrastructure Investment Management Center, which is very um, Korea-focused, should have an international, say, African branch. Um, the Korea Infrastructure Credit Guarantee Fund, um, which again is Korea-focused, um, there's a lot that could benefit um, the international. And when we look at the amount of outlay required to make a significant difference in Africa, it's a really, really small percentage. And so in conclusion, I would say um, public-private partnerships offer a new vista for um, Korea and Africa um, cooperation, which is not, would not, will not be rooted in aid dependency over the decades, but will be rooted in mutually beneficial commercial relationships that benefit the Korean people and benefit the uh, vast uh, African continent. Thank you. Thank you to Philippe, Yangte, and Raymond for an in-depth, insightful um, talk, each focusing on Africa's um, overall investment environment and then going into the Chinese models, the advantages and the disadvantages.
and then going into Korea's activities, and then delving more micro level into the benefits of uh, public-private partnership. So um, in the beginning of the event, I neglected to mention that you all walked in with these papers that Raymond referred to. And um, these are written by our three speakers. And if you haven't received them, uh, please uh, ask one of our staff and we'll give it to you. But these will also be posted on the web when it's uh, complete to go on. So you can also download them. But without further ado, I wanted to open up uh, for questions because, um, yes. If you can identify your name uh, and your affiliation, that'd be great. Hi, thank you. Uh, Michael Billington. I work with uh, Lyndon LaRouche in the Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, Dr. Kim, um, there's been talk in Seoul, in the Blue House, about possibly setting up some sort of an institute in Africa to bring Africans together to learn the Korean model, to study the Korean model, the industrial development and the village uh, development model that came out of the Park Chung-hee era and brought about the Korean miracle. So I wonder if you could comment on that whole question of how you're going to educate, uh, your view of educating Africa on that issue. And secondly, if I may, um, the, uh, in the midst of this uh, global economic breakdown crisis in the West especially, probably the most important development of the last months is the coming together of Russia and South Korea and Russia and China on uh, the idea of great developments in the far east of Russia uh, and possibly using that kind of development approach to also finally solving the North Korea problem. So I'm wondering if you think that cooperation uh, is something that can be carried over into the pressing crisis to the whole world, which is the development of Africa. Uh, and that rather seeing just um, competition between Korea and China, for instance, if you think there can be cooperative elements uh, on great projects in Africa. Thank you for your difficult question. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we uh, emphasize very much on uh, emphasize very much uh, the. the the training programs these days, uh, because um, uh, in terms of Korean approaches in in Africa, uh, as I told you, uh, we have two uh, different approaches which are combined together. One is uh, the organizations, not for not for profit organizations, under the uh, control of the Korean government, uh, and the private sector companies. We usually uh, form a certain type of consortiums when we go to Africa. So uh, the public uh, sector organizations, they uh, try to teach our, um, they try to share our experience and knowledge that we uh, experienced before. And the private company, of course, they uh, try to make some, uh, some uh, profit there. But uh, if, uh, if there are only uh, private companies in Africa, there are too much risk, and sometimes the public sector can uh, make uh, some buffer zone for uh, preventing some, some kind of uh, risks too. So we invite people uh, to Korea to educate them with a special, uh, special ODA programs. So we have a special organizations called COICA, Korea International Cooperation Agency. So they, uh, they set up annual programs for uh, inviting uh, the high-ranking uh, officials from uh, developing world. So they uh, educate them. Also, we have some uh, separate programs run by uh, different organizations like uh, K-Water or some uh, housing corporations, etc. So uh, our, our programs also diversified in that way. And, uh, and these days, um, of course, we, we try to uh, we try to educate them, but we we want to share some good points and bad points too, because we also experienced some failures in the past. So we had some uh, we experienced some setbacks and some uh, barriers and some uh, difficulties at the time. So uh, we our, our education programs uh, uh, running that way, and 
Uh, these days, uh, we have some uh, financial crisis in uh, European communities. Uh, but uh, but uh, as I told you, the Korea is a late comer in terms of the uh, in terms of the activities in Africa. So uh, we are augmenting our ODAs and monies for help, but uh, there are still some uh, kinds of uh, the limit in our uh, Korea because we we also have. We are still uh, making uh, economic development, so our process is not finished yet. So uh, we are trying to uh, double or triple our activities by uh, putting some more money as a financial uh, aid. But um, this kind of uh, competition with uh, China and, and other nations can also uh, boost the, the helping activities in African nations, too. I agree with that. My name is Julius, Julius Sabo from the Africa Growth Initiative, Brookings. Um, I have two questions, one for Kim. Uh, Kim, I didn't get from your presentation something about how the Koreans manage to govern themselves in a way that put national priorities ahead of uh, parochial self-interest in such a way that I want to hear something about the Korean governance model, which I probably missed in your presentation, and how that could benefit Africa. Then the second question is to Raymond. Uh, since independence, uh, Raymond, one of the problems faced in Africa, which you know very well, is the problem of governance. There's a huge mistrust between the elite, the ruling elite, and those governed, between the public sector and the private sector in Africa. There's a dichotomy. No, the elite don't trust the, the, the masses. The masses don't trust the elite. How do you bridge that gap? To the extent that, and that relates to the question or the question that Kim would answer, how do you ensure that those who are leading the generation of leaders in Africa share the same aspiration as their common, as their countrymen? How do they see in the same mm -hmm. direction? Until they be able to see in the same direction, then would those national plans that you need to put in place have meaning? Then will those public par partnership programs that you want to see have can be a, can can really make sense. That's my opinion. Thank you. I, I will make a kind of a clarification about the way uh, Koreans did. Uh, after the Korean War, uh, we suffered a lot in terms of politi national politics and, of course, and economic difficulties, but. Uh, it's early 1960s that a new approach was uh, set up, put into practice in Korea. But uh, I, I think I have to add one fact that we uh, had actually a strong leadership. Sometimes there, there are some controversies uh, over this, uh, this fact, if uh, the president was a dictator or not. So, but at the time, in the situational context, uh, he, he made, I think he made a great contribution to the uh, economic development of Korea by setting up a lot of uh, structured bodies for uh, different sectors, like uh, housing corporations in 1962, and also some uh, economic plans, the five-year economic plans too. But uh, we, we began by focusing on uh, processing uh, trade at, at first. But uh, by and by, we uh, proceeded to constructing more infrastructures like uh, high, no, no, not high speed, but expressways and housings and etc. And also, um, the the diligence of the Korean people played a, another role in, in this uh, development pr process because traditionally the education was very much valued in our society. So even uh, for poor families, uh, they uh, tried to educate their children with all the cost, it can, it can, it can suffer. So uh, this kind of process uh, were all combined to make a synergy over some 
some several decades. And finally, uh, we are uh, reaching this, this uh, period. But we, we call it a telescope revolution in a specific terminology. But uh, there can be also some negative uh, byproducts in this, in this uh, process also. So losing some traditional values and putting too much value on capitalistic market, market mechanisms or something like that. So we are uh, still uh, struggling in our society. On the one hand, making some economic, and on the other, some political and uh, cultural development. We, can, we cannot get two rabbits at the same time, economic and political. <laughs> so, yeah. um, no, I, there's no um, easy answer to that question, but um, let me rephrase it. Um, you know, it's a bit like a chicken and egg issue. Um, are we going to wait until we have the best form or the most acceptable form of governance before we make progress with economics? Are we going to move ahead with economics and hope that the other follows? Um, I think that the way forward is the more we focus on the institutions and not the individuals, we start making incremental progress. If you take a look at the World Bank's Doing Business um, report, every year you have at least three out of the ten top performers being African countries. And it specifies precisely what institutional and policy changes have led to improved business environments. And I think that is where, and as I mentioned, we need to be able to look at the countries that are making progress in these areas and then <coughs> provide more support to consolidate um, the, um, the um, process because that's when you start seeing um, the um, governance dynamic becoming more productive and less confrontational and destructive. Um, we've, we're noticing that um, this year, I think there are 24 elections in, in, in Africa, but increasingly we are seeing less um, contention, less violence um, associated with governance. In fact, most people had no idea that Zambia had presidential elections. Overnight you had elections, the next day the new president was sworn in. It did not make the news because it's not the usual African news, but that is progress. And I think what we need to do is find those emerging and performing um, economies, help um, them move up to the next level, which I think is a move away from a public sector focus to more private sector development, and they will then become the beacons of uh, change and engines of change across the continent. To the very back. Hi. Yes, thanks very much for all your uh, interesting insights. I'm uh, Nico Columbant. I'm a journalist with Voice of America. And uh, I want to talk to hear just a little bit about the uh, so-called land grab issue. Uh, a lot of uh, activists and small-scale farmers are, are very worried about this uh, increasing rush for Africa's resources. And uh, Korea came up a lot uh, during the uh, Madagascar political problems and still does. So I was wondering uh, what you had to say about that, uh, that fear of the land grab and how it affects uh, small-scale African farmers. I mean, I'll, I'll take a first stab. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting topic for sure. Um, let's see. I mean, it, it, clearly there are a lot of different actors involved in this. Part of it is is countries uh, like like Korea, but also China and and uh, plenty in the in the Gulf that are um, you know concerned about medium term and long term food security, um, and so um, see relatively cheap or quite cheap. Uh, fertile or potentially fertile land in Africa, and, and um, you know, obviously the, the, the temptation is, is, is strong given that. Um, I think it's in some ways it's early, to, a bit early to, to cast any final judgments just because there's been so many deals announced and then, you know, nothing happens <laughs> or, or um, stuff happens, but we don't really know what it is. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is that there's not a – when I can tell, there's not a, a very established track record. Clearly, there's concern, though, if these deals are, are being done uh, without local involvement or knowledge, which happens, 
uh, if they're bad terms for the uh, for the for the host country, which happens. Um, I mean, I, sometimes I'm sure uh, they negotiate better terms where where they don't forsake their own food security or do things that would you know really distort potentially fragile uh, local local agricultural markets. Uh, but the, you know there there really are there are there are risks associated with it. Um, frankly, a, lo a lot of the attention, a, lo a lot of this investment has, has is focused all over the continent and, and elsewhere. But the Horn of Africa, which happens to be you know extremely food insecure itself, um, doesn't mean that there aren't models that work. You know you you lease it, you don't sell it, uh, yeah, you don't you don't sell it outright. Uh, uh, but uh, those are some in, some initial thoughts, and, and you know, land obviously is a very contentious issue, uh, very personal, um, and so uh, there's a lot of ways to go wrong. Um, yeah, the land issue is an important one because land has a, not just a cultural but a very uh, generational significance in Africa. Um, people relate to, you know, where their father's land is more than where the national flag is. So in that context, um, issues relating to investment that would involve, you know, taking or sequestering a huge tract of land are very sensitive. And as Philippe rightly pointed out, um, engaging, sensitizing, involving, and compensating adequately is of the essence. Um, that have been, having been said, um, long-term leases of land are not new in Africa or across the globe, um, particularly when it comes to um, significant um, capital-intensive um, investments. And so we need to find a way that is not just um, environmentally and socioeconomically friendly, but that relates to that you know, special place that land has in African culture and African communities, and to make sure that it's a win-win for all parties, and people don't just wake up one morning and find out that their entire village now belongs to someone else, and they should move 10 kilometers downstream to somewhere they've never known before. Um, but um, generally, whether you're thinking about mining, um, large-scale agriculture, um, manufacturing um, there or service industries, the, we have to find models of land use that work for the continent and also work for private investors. And that's what I think, that's, that's the um, happy medium we need to find. I, I, I want to add something. Sure. Yeah. Uh, personally, I visited uh, Madagascar and uh, at the time, uh, there was some uh, problem and criticism uh, made by uh, Western uh, media at the time. They uh, called Asian presence in Africa a uh, kind of neo-colonialism. But uh, I think um, as a representative of the ministry uh, dealing with the infrastructure issues, uh, we cannot, we cannot uh, make any infrastructure equipment any place we want, because there should be some order, good order. I mean, uh, the first thing uh, the minister, Madagascar minister, uh, asked us, asked to the Ministry of Land in Korea, was that uh, the help for the reform of land use at the time. Because we, we uh, experienced the same thing when we constructed infrastructures. We uh, had some difficulty in uh, clarifying clarifying the owners and uh, how we uh, how we divide this land into uh, several pieces and for public goods and private goods. But Madagascar, in like in other African nations, the relationship between land owners and land on which living uh, the people live are not so clear. So uh, I think the first thing we have to do is to clarify the survey lands and clarify the ownership of the land first before proceeding to uh, constructing more infrastructures. So uh, that should be uh, done by the uh, the African nations that has their own lands and some uh, regional uh, gov government or something. And 
I think we have time for one last question, gentleman in the back middle. Yes, microphone. Uh, Lawrence Freeman. I'm the uh, director of the African Desk at ER Magazine. Been involved in African policy for over 20 years. I think there's a f one premise there that's not been discussed properly here, which um, actually the ambassador of South Africa referenced yesterday, which is that the world fundamentally changed in 2008, and the free market casino economy crashed and is now crashing today as we speak and can't be saved. Uh, we're trying to produce a Glass-Steagall reform to get rid of some of the toxic waste of the banks, but the system is not going to work anymore. So Africa has to take that in consideration because the private investment is not going to be the savior anymore. The other mistake, which I hope people correct, especially the, the Korean Economic Institute, is that the statistics of the World Bank, IMF, and all these private associations, I've read some of them, they're all wrong. All these statistics that show these great rates of growth, they're false statistics. They're based on currency price valuations. They're not based on real development of the economy, energy, growth of agriculture, growth of transportation. For example, the IMF predicted Tunisia as one of the great emerging economies. They were not wrong, they were completely wrong. And all these predictions of emerging economies are wrong. Africa right now is, could be on the verge of an Arab Spring that could overtake all of Sub-Saharan Africa for lack of power, lack of water, lack of transportation, lack of food. Private PPPs won't solve that. I don't think poor people can pay tolls on loads. We need government-directed credit from countries like South Korea, China, Russia, and hopefully my country at some point will wise up to build great infrastructure transformational projects to bring food immediately. Nigeria could collapse within a couple of years if they don't get power. South Sudan could collapse if they don't get food. So my, my question to Mr. Kim especially is, what kind of orientation do you have for the real physical economy for public credit to help these economies? China, I agree, is not the perfect model, but it's been something because the West has been completely derelict. I'd like to have your approach. Thank you, sir. Let me go first. Um, probably be a clever thing. I think um, uh, uh, Mr. Freeman makes um, excellent points, and I think the point that he makes um, emphatically that I do agree with is that um, Africa needs significant investment in infrastructure if it's to A, govern well, and B, see any modicum of um, sustainable economic development. I agree with that completely. Um, I disagree with the premise that um, what we need is public sector investments. And why I respectfully do so is because we've tried that before. And we know that bureaucrats don't make the best business people. It doesn't work in this country. I have visited and worked in 45 African countries. It doesn't work there. But I've, in the African countries I've been to, I have seen the person on the street making rational economic choices. There was um, when the, um, the Kenyan um, cell phone company Safaricom was floated on a Kenyan stock exchange. It wasn't the people in suits that made the most difference. There was actually a clip in the Washington Post. Um, a reporter overheard two market women. If anybody has been to Africa and you know what a market woman is, probably not educated, probably income rich and asset poor, probably doesn't even know where the stock market office is. But these people were talking about participating in this IPO because they had heard that they could buy low and sell high. It makes sense. So what we need to do is have structures that release Africa's entrepreneurship with potential. We do not need the public sector telling African countries what to do. Neither do we need new models. I have followed African, politi African politics and African um, economics and finance closely for over four decades. Believe me, we have tried every fad in the book. Every fad we have tried. 
and we are worse off now than we were in the 60s, really, because we have not been inward looking, identified potential, and directed assistance where potential is greatest. Um, the second thing I disagree with is that the, um, the um, stats on Africa's economic growth are wrong. Um, uh, again, I have been to these countries over a period of time. Um, what we are not seeing, and that's, this is where we probably agree, Mr. Freeman, is we're not seeing a lot of the benefits of the growth trickling down to the ordinary citizen. That's an economic development problem, not necessarily a growth problem. We are seeing growth, but we're not seeing it translating in, translating down and benefiting the people. And that is a challenge, not just for African governments, but for the multilateral, bilateral, and non-governmental partners of African countries to help make sure that the people who need these benefits the most, you know, get some of it. It is ridiculous, not just in this country, but in Afri particularly in African countries that are poor, to have, you know, 99% of the wealth with 0.01% of the people. It doesn't make sense. We need, a, we, we, we need to re-jig um, that. And so that is, um, the, that, that's a big difference. And finally, and very quickly, I would say that, um, you know, what we need, and uh, I, I share, I, I have nothing in common with the Tea Party, with all due respect to Tea Party people here. But in Africa, what we do need is less government. Uh, because you think about, um, I was doing a survey recently of um, people in the diaspora who have gone back to African countries. Where do you find them? In government offices and government projects. That's not where we need them. We need them out there creating <coughs> jobs and participating in the economy. And so I think we need more private investment, um, not just from Africa and Africans, but we need more private, more private engagement um, from friendly um, nations like Korea. Because that, those private um, dollars okay, come with people who know how to invest money and people who are looking for return on investment not bureaucrats who need to have a burn rate, i.e. spend money to show we have spent, you know, 100 million on aid in this year. But we need people who come in with the approach that we're going to spend 100 million this year and we want to get back so much over the next number of years. So they would make sure that capacity, infrastructure, management is all improved so there's a win-win. And so that's where we do have some areas of agreement and disagreement, but I think what we both would agree on is that the world has changed since 2000, for Africa, I think since 2000. The end of the 90s were a torrid decade for Africa. Um, where Africa is now is at that cusp, where that entrepreneurship spirit needs to take over, and believe me, it will drive the politics. Did you want to respond quickly? We're short on time. Yeah. Mm. I think uh, the most important thing is uh, risk factor. Uh, if there are less and less risks, maybe uh, the private sector companies can have access to African markets more freely. But uh, why, why we uh, sometimes count on uh, public sector? Because public sector means less risk, less risk. So we do some construction diplomacies. Korean uh, government is very interested in uh, construction diplomacies for the private sector to uh, have access to the African markets too, because they can cover some uh, some kinds of uh, the negative uh, results. So uh, in that case, uh, the uh, in this stage, I think the private sector and uh, public sector they have to go together, not only uh, the the public. Uh, strong engagement. So um, as, a, as a civil servant, uh, I, I, I'm not for the uh, profit making only. So every time I see the, the private companies in Korea, uh, I always uh, try to tell them uh, what is the uh, main objective of the policy orientation. Because we don't want to make people dependent on Korea. It's the same situation in Korea too. When we uh, help the people in need, we want to see them stand on their own, finally. 
we give them uh, public housing, but it doesn't mean that we make them live forever in that public housing. We are waiting for them to stand and get out of public housing as uh, equal citizens. That's, that's the, the main uh, idea of the Korean approach. Well, um, we're run out of time, but if you have any questions at the end, we could uh, personally take them. But thank you very much for joining us, and please join me in thanking the three speakers. Thank you.